again. Good, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, we're going to begin our time as we have the last couple weeks, focusing on what it means to, to worship God, what it means to surrender to God. I, I want to ask some folks to come up and join me this morning. They don't know I'm going to do this. Uh, but I would like to ask the, those that are, if you want to call them the core group or the leaders or whatever, of our men's ministry that are here and of our women's ministry that are here, if you would come up here and join me down here on the, on the uh, ground floor, I'd appreciate that. I know we've got several of our guys that are gone. Uh, a couple of them are gone down in Louisiana working with, uh, with electrical uh, things, getting things established back there. So are any of our men here that are part of our men's core group? Oh, come on, guys. I know we got some men here. Come on, join me up here. Okay, women. Where are my women that are part of the women's ministry? They're out in the hallway. Uh, Tim Wilson, will you do me a favor? Gail, holler at them and ask them to come in here. Yeah, we want to get them in here. I, I, I want to be able now, some, some of the ones I know that are not here, uh, I know that Ben Cooper is not here. I know that um, Josh Keene is not here because they're working for OEC uh, down in Louisiana. They're hopefully coming back in a couple more days. I'm looking around. Um, I'm looking, yeah, I've got, got our women for women's ministry. Sorry, you got to come join us here. Um, I'm trying, I'm looking around. Where's Brian Gans? Brian, yeah, well, yeah, it is. Brian's not made it out of, ah, oh, I'm going to get him. Okay, look, when Brian Gans comes in, everybody needs to turn around and say happy birthday at the same time because it's Brian Gans' birthday. So, okay, this all, it's pretty much good. we got a couple of others I know that are not here. But this, is, this represents our men and, and our women's ministry teams, and, and they play a vital role in what goes on uh, here, what we're seeking to do as a church family, ministering to men, ministering to women, therefore ministering to families. And so I want you to, 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 to be praying for them. You know, last week we did this with the Sunday school workers. The week before that, we did, did this with, um, with, with our deacons. But they are representative of all of us. And as we come before the Lord this morning to worship, they, they stand here because as they seek to worship, as they seek to lead us in these ministries, they're surrendering themselves to God as well. And so as we surrender as a church this morning to the Father to worship Him, let me read a passage to you from Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's why we come together. That's why we come together to worship. To bow the knee means to surrender. We come together to bow the knee. We come together to point to the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this morning as we worship Him, may every tongue confess, may every heart cry out as we surrender ourselves to God. Father, we thank You for Your love. I thank You for those that stand here this morning representing the ministries of this church to men and to women. Father, the time and effort they put in. But Lord, I know that in order for them to do that, it means they must first surrender themselves to you. And I thank you for that and pray that they would do that every moment of every day of their lives. Father, that's a tremendous challenge for all of us. But it begins this morning. It begins as we come together as a family in Christ that we bow the knee to you, that we surrender ourselves to you. And as we do so, Father... We recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, as we worship you this morning, may we do so with hearts that are surrendered to you. May this service and all that we do through this church family be about you, not about us, but about you, Father. 
Well, we love you and we praise you. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. I understand that, uh, that we also had a birthday this last week of our fearless leader, uh, Brother Tim. He looks pretty good for 65, don't you think? <laughs> so stand up and we're going to sing happy birthday to Tim. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tim. Whatever. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Brian. Happy birthday, Brian. <laughs> Anybody else want to say anything before we get started or <laughs> sing a song? Okay, we're ready. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord as we wait upon the Lord. God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not think you won't grow. We wait upon the Lord, we wait upon the Lord, and we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, and we wait upon the Lord, and we wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong delight. Perfect 
something about Janine that you probably don't know. She actually has a black belt. Um, she has a black belt in Amazon shopping. <laughs> when we had COVID, you know, and they're all worried about the getting money, Amazon actually emailed her and said, we need a little help here. And she said, I'll be glad to help. And she, and she, and she did. She did. Amazon is this company that has been built on their original business model was we're going to have a warehouse full of goods and we're going to send it directly to the customers. I have 1.3 billion employees. Their revenue is $113 billion a year. $113 billion a year. It's amazing. This weekend we are commemorating 9-11. 9-11 when, when those two towers stood there had 50,000 employees. On any given day, there were 40,000 people went through those two buildings on any given day. 90,000 people are in that vicinity on any given day before they were destroyed. After they were destroyed, uh, Americans decided to build what was called the Freedom Tower. It came, came to be known One World Trade Center. It's set 1,776 feet tall, commemorating the year the Declaration of Independence was signed, 1,776. And it is interesting that, that the, the wreckage from that thing was 1.8 million tons of wreckage. But Americans, being resilient as we are, we rebuilt. And we built something that we're proud of. So you've got this model of Amazon who has built this mega business. And we've got a picture in our own country of, of the Twin Towers that were replaced by One World Trade Center and we built something. So the question for me and my life as a believer is, what am I building my life on? See, Jesus is talking in Matthew 7 on the Sermon on the Mount and he says, he said, if you build your house on sand, it's not stable. The problem is, I think, for some, as it is for me, maybe my issue is not always that I build on sand, Maybe my issue is I don't build in the planning stage on Christ before I ever start building in the first place. I'm not building on the, the, the praise of who God is. I'm not recognizing how worthy he is, whether I recognize it in a worship setting or whether I recognize it in my everyday life. Do you? Is everything that you build, your careers, your finances, your relationships, are they first built on what God would do? Are they first built on the foundation of Christ? Because if they're not, like Jesus said, they're sand. And when the storms come, and they do come, you're going to falter. God doesn't say, I'm going to take away your problems. He says, I'll be with you in the midst of the problems. I will be there with it. When God creates the heavens and the earth, the, 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 the earth was void, and it was the picture is it's all water, and it's this turbulent, and it's churning, and it's turbulent all the time. And what God says, he creates heavens and earth. He separates the land from the water. You see what he did? He didn't stop the turbulence. He just gave it a boundary. And he said, this is as far as you can go. This is it. In my life, if I want to be who Christ wants me to be, I've got to recognize the foundation of what I'm building for myself needs to be first 
be built for God. So what is your life like? What are you doing now? And you think, you know, this is really not for God. This is just for me. Let's sing about it. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Oh 
your love to both of us. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not somebody I believe in Hold on to me When I miss the light the night has stolen when I'm slamming all the doors you've opened, hold on to me. Hold on to me. Hold on to me when it's too dark to see you when I am sure I have reached the end. Hold on to me when I forget I need you. When I let go, hold me again. When I don't feel like I'm worth defending When I'm tired of all my pretending Hold on to me When I start to break in desperation Underneath the weight of expectations hold on to me hold on to me hold on to me when it's too dark to see you when I am sure I have reached the end. Hold on to me when I forget I need you. When I let go, hold me again. I could rest here in your arms forever. Cause I know nobody loves me better Hold on to me Hold on to me Father, we praise you for your presence. Pray that you would guide us in the rest of this service. Speak through Tim, touch our hearts and change our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate that so much. Let me first of all send out another thank you to Roy and Robin for leading us in worship last week. In Gary and Janine's absence, we appreciate that so much. And let me also say a special thank you. Our kids are making their way out right now. Thank you 
for the birthday cards from Wednesday night. I appreciate that. I came back to my office. Uh, I does say Thursday. I meant Wednesday night. Get that straight. When I came back to my office Thursday morning and I uh, had a bunch of cards laying uh, outside my office and a bunch of birthday cards, and I, I really appreciate that. That was really neat, so thank you for that so much. Take your Bibles and turn not to 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, there we go, 714, but to Numbers. I bet you wondered, would I keep my promise? Would I actually move on? Yes. Numbers 14. Numbers 14. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10, and I'll go ahead and warn my wife right now. As you know, at the end of the service, uh, we're, we're starting today a process in the next three or four weeks of taking pictures for a church directory. And uh, sure, in case you're wondering, my phone is sitting right down here in the edge of the pew. So uh, that's, that's our, one of our cameras. So everybody knows where they're going, whether it be this week or the next couple of weeks. So thank you for that. Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Then all the congregation, this is referring to, to the nation of Israel, raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Let's pray. Father, as we come before your throne of grace this morning, we find ourselves at a point of decision as a nation, as we remember yesterday in the 20-year anniversary of a horrific event in our history. Father, we find ourselves at the point of decision as a nation of who we will be. We find ourselves at a point of decision as a people, as Christians, as families, as a convention, as a church. Lord, in the next few moments, speak to us, and may we take what we have received in the last few weeks and now understand how important that is as we look at the next step to being all that you've called us to be. Bless this, bless this time, Father, for it is in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. You know, it never ceases to amaze me the success orientation in our world, especially in our country. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is pretty amazing when you get down to it. Professional football has begun. Everything in the National Football League is about success. You're the hero one week can be the failure of the next week. Looking for a new team and a new job. College football has begun. And it's amazing how there was a point in time 
when a new coach would come in and they would understand how long it would take to build a program. But now, if you don't have immediate success, the naysayers immediately step in and begin to speak of your demise. We just finished the Olympic Games, and I assure you as many young people from around the world were celebrated for their great accomplishments, there were others that didn't come home to those great parades, and there were many coaches and mentors who found themselves out in the cold, if you will, because they failed to live up to expectations. When we were living overseas, we learned the game of that we call soccer, but the rest of the world calls football, how important that, that game is when the World Cup came along. And, and I remember when we first moved to Italy hearing about the great Italian football team and how in the last World Cup where they competed, they had ended up in, in what they call a shootout at the end. And, and it all came down to a, a kick by one Italian player who hit the crossbar. And the ball failed to go into the goal and they lost. So they remembered that quite well, and they managed to make it to the World Cup again the next time it was played. And lo and behold, it came down to the championship game, and it came down to a shootout once again. And once again, although it was a different player, he hit the crossbar, and they lost again. No one thought about what it took to get there. No one thought about the fact that they were in the championship game. It was all about the fact that they hit that crossbar. Because everything is about success, about winning. Not just in athletics, but in business, and in finances, in relationships, in cooking for Pete's sake. Everything is about winning. Go into a bookstore and look at the titles that you'll see in the bookstore. If you go online, you're looking at books, and you'll see all these, these titles that you were attracted to, like 10 Steps to Financial Security, or how to start a personal business and be successful, or one I remember reading when I was in college and seminary. In fact, it was required reading, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And then, of course, there is one of my favorites. There is what I refer to as the Dummies series. You know, you've seen all those books. Uh, auto Repair for Dummies. Excel for Dummies. Believe me, I need that one investing, golf, law, literature, uh, guitar, grilling, grilling for dummies, yes. Piano for dummies. Do you know there are over 340 different titles in the Four Dummies series? I mean, even in the church world, we have books that people are attracted to about the church and about success, the characteristics of effective churches, and I could go on and on and on and on and on. But let me ask you a question, though. How would you feel if you walked into a bookstore and you saw a book and the title of the book was A Surefire Formula for Failure? Now, now, my guess is that might catch your eye, but it's not going to catch your pocketbook because we're interested in success, not in failure. I, I remember an old commercial years ago, and it shows this young man and he's running and he's running and it, it appears at first maybe he's a he's a track athlete maybe he's training for something and and the commercial goes on and it says you know we, we grow up we dream about being doctors and lawyers and attorneys and we dream about being athletes and so forth and at the last minute you suddenly realize the young man is running from somebody who's chasing him and as the hand reaches out to grab him you realize that it's the arm of a police officer and as the police officer grabs him and begins to pull him down he has this hor the young man has this horrified look in his face and suddenly the announcer or the narrator says no one ever grows up thinking I want to be a junkie that gets your attention no, no, no one ever grows up thinking you know I want to be a failure no one ever grows up thinking, I want to fail at anything. No one grows up dreaming about failing at business or relationships or athletics or anything. And you know, the Israelites didn't set out to fail. But not only did they do it, they pioneered the formula for failure. And sadly, way too many Christians follow it in their own lives. 
on the job, in their families, and even in the churches. What is the formula for failure? Well, I'm going to give you three simple steps this morning. The formula for failure. First of all, accept perceptions, not promises. Accept perceptions, not, not promises. A couple weeks ago, I, I was made aware of a fellow by the name of Clifford Hilliard had passed away. Clifford, uh, still a young man, he was a police officer down in Port Lavaca when we pastored down there many years ago. He had to retire from that profession a few years ago due to some health issues. But I, I remembered Clifford. Clifford was kind of a mountain of a man. He was about six foot four, big guy. He, he, if he was on your side, it was a great thing. But boy, if you had done something wrong, you didn't want Clifford after you. But he had a great, great personality, great heart. And I remember Clifford in one particular situation. It was the month of uh, October, I believe it was. It was sometimes referred to as Clergy Appreciation Month. I didn't think much about it. We were in the middle of a Tuesday morning Bible study that we did with some of our senior adults. And all of a sudden, as I, now you, you have to understand, you know, I'm sitting there teaching this class, and there's about 20 people in there, and two police officers show up at that door. Now, the first thing that goes through my mind as a parent is something's wrong. But then fortunately, my wife appeared right behind him immediately, and she was smiling, and so I thought, okay, everything's okay. Don't worry about that. And the next thing I know, well, they come in, and they start talking about, I'm under arrest. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what in the world's going on here, but folks, I want to tell you something. They did the whole thing, and this got recorded with pictures and video, and they took me down the hallway of the church doing the perp walk. And I had no earthly idea what was coming. Now, the police car was parked out in the front of the church. And when they brought me out, they opened up the back door, and lo and behold, there was this big basket of stuff in there, and it all said, thank you, pastor, and da-da-da-da-da, and all this, and the whole thing had been this big joke, and it was fantastic and wonderful, and you know, my heart started beating again, and what a wonderful experience, until word started going around town that they had seen the police chief's car in front of the Baptist church. And the pastor with his hands handcuffed behind his back being put into the back of the cruiser. Well, where do you think that took off? Yeah. See, it's amazing what perceptions, perceptions are so much stronger than reality. You know, over the years I've learned that perception not only is more important than reality, sometimes it takes the place of reality. And that, that can be positive, but it can also be negative. I wonder how many of you have looked back on pictures of what was known as the old Berlin Wall. And it wasn't just a wall, but it was actually a couple of walls, and there was this area in between that was patrolled uh, by Soviet soldiers on one hand and by, by German soldiers on the other. And they had dogs. There were over 6,500 dogs that were used to patrol that area during that time. And, and you, if you've ever seen pictures, some of the most ominous pictures were of those soldiers carrying one of, their, one of their automatic weapons with an attack dog with them. Now here's the interesting thing. When that wall came down, one of the things that people discovered was out of 6,500 attack dogs, only 1,000 of them had actually been trained to be attack dogs. The others were just pets and would have been just as happy to curl up in your lap as anything else. But see, that wasn't the point. The point was the perception that was given by them walking along with their handler and the way that they were treated. Now, you need to understand what has happened here to Israel up to this point. Here's Israel, what an amazing experience they have had. There, 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 has been, there have been miracles. There has been deliverance from bondage in Egypt. They, they have walked through the Red Sea on dry ground as God has parted it before them. God has given them the commandments. They're on the edge of the promised land, and now they've sent out these 12 spies to spy out the land that, by the way, they're not supposed to come back and say bad things. They're just spying out the best way to go in. But when the 12 come back, all of them say, oh yeah, it's everything God said and more. But 10 of the 12 say, oh, but there's a problem. The people over there are really big. And the defenses are really strong. 
and we're really not in good shape, and we really can't do that. We, we can't take that. And so as they lay all these things out, somewhere along the line, this Israelite nation, these people who have experienced all these amazing things of God up to this point, suddenly forget, you know, they're at the edge of the promised land, but they forget the promised part. And so they begin to accept the perceptions. And the perceptions weren't positive. You see, here's the deal. In order to, to accept the perceptions, you have to forget the promises. You have to forget the fact that God said, I will need, never leave you or forsake you. You have to forget the fact that God said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You have to forget the fact that God said, I will supply all your needs. You have to forget the fact that God said that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You have to forget the fact that the Scripture says that with God all things are possible. You have to forget the fact that the Scripture says, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In order to accept the perceptions, you have to forget the fact that God said, I will take your sin and separate it as far from you as the east is from the west. In order to accept the perception, those are all the things you have to forget. Now, now let me ask you a question. What would have happened if David, looking upon Goliath, had decided, you know what? He's too big, and I'm too little, and I'm too young, and he has a weapon, and I don't, and I can't win. What happens? What happens if Gideon with his 300 decides, you know what, I started out with thousands upon thousands and now I'm down to this and I'm looking down in that, in that camp and I see how many they have. What happens if Gideon, in spite of the fact that he's thrown out not one but two fleeces that God has dealt with, what happens if he decides, you know what, we can't do that. But you see, when he gets involved with kingdom work, we do that all the time. We, we look and say, well, you know what, I'm just one person. Ah, I can't, you, you can't really make a difference. You, 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 you don't have, I don't have a wall covered with certificates and diplomas. I don't have the money and the resources. You know, our church is too small, or we're out in the middle of nowhere, or you don't have a new building, or maybe you do have a new building, but it's empty. Okay, you know what I say to all that? So what? So what? We belong to the God who is all, who owns everything. The scripture says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. By the way, the hills are his too. How quickly we forget that. Folks, we need to remember though, understand, we're talking about the formula for failure. So if you want to follow the formula for failure, whatever you do, forget the promises. Accept the perceptions. Here's another thing you want to do. If you want to follow the formula for failure, follow your instincts, not the Holy Spirit. Israel, think about all they had seen, all they had experienced up to this point. I mean, I, I would like to think that if I had walked on dry ground with water up on either side of me being held back by who knows what, I would like to think that if I had seen fire come down from heaven, I would like to think that if I had seen all the things that they saw, all the things that God had done, I would have reacted differently. And yet, do you notice that in spite of all they had experienced, their first instinct when they hear this report is to run. And not just run, but to go back. Go back to Egypt. Not look, let's not just run. In fact, let's get us new leaders who will lead us back to the same pit we were in the middle of before. That's their first instinct. You know, animals and, and, and insects and so forth have amazing instincts, survival instincts that we're, we're already seeing some of the birds begin to migrate. I noticed the other day a couple flocks of Canadian geese are starting to make their way south. Considering this is September in Oklahoma, that worries me a little bit. But they migrate. Other animals hibernate. They have tremendous instincts. But you know, I remember many, many years ago, we had a little 
border collie. I, I can't remember exactly how we came across her. Seems like she may have been given to us or something, but her, her name was, was Taffy. Taffy, I, I don't know what was wrong with that dog, but, but Taffy was an interesting dog. We, we, we'd had her for a while. She, she'd meshed with everybody around our house, and all of a sudden she managed to get out, and she was gone for four days. We looked everywhere for her. And this was back in the pre-Facebook days before you could throw pictures up and say, this dog is missing, please look, please help us, and so forth. That, that wasn't going to happen. So we're out driving one night, and lo and behold, we find her. She's like half a mile from the house. And that, that poor dog had absolutely no clue where she was. But the reason she had no clue where she was was, was because she had no clue where home was. I want to tell you something. Israel's problem, they literally didn't know where home was. And so rather than follow God's lead, they were relying on their instincts, and their instincts were going to fail them. Here's a couple of problems with instincts. Number one is real simple. Your instincts can be wrong. Okay, I know some of you as, as children saw this, and some of you as parents and probably grandparents. You know, the big movie nobody wants to see now is, is Frozen. Because I'm so tired of hearing Let It Go. I hear that song, and I do, oh man. But there was, a, there was a, a, a movie that came out a few years ago called A Bug's Life. Any of you remember A Bug's Life? Oh yeah, I see a few hands going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You remember there's this one point where they're, they're out, and there is this there's a bug zapper. And there's some of them that are kind of buzzing around the bug zapper. One of them says, says, Jack, Jack, don't do it. And he says, I can't help it. It's so beautiful. You know what's coming. You see it. But he just couldn't stop himself. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> you ever followed your instincts and you got zapped? Think about that. How many times we followed our instincts and it didn't work out quite the way we thought it should. You know what? Your instincts can be wrong. Let me tell you something else. Why follow your instincts when as a child of God, as a Christian, you have something better? Those of you in the Gospel Project, one of the things we learned this morning is that we were made in the image of God. So number one, we're all made in the image of God. But number two, if you are a Christian, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have His Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Why would you follow your instincts, which can be wrong, rather than the Spirit of God, who is always right? Think about that. In John 16, we're told that the Spirit of God is within us to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment, and guide us into all truth because He's not operating on His own initiative, but by, by whatever He hears or sees from the Father. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, we're told that the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. Why does He do that? So that He can make them known to us. Why would you rely on your instincts rather than the Spirit of God knowing that? Well, remember, we're talking about the surefire formula for failure. We're not talking about success. So, so whatever you do, if you want to fail, don't listen to the Holy Spirit. Follow your instincts. You know, Israel did, and, and well, <laughs> you know how well that worked out for them? You want a surefire for you, formula for failure? Rely on your instincts, not on the Spirit of God. Accept perceptions, not promises. Let me, let me give you one last one. Wait for second chances. Don't seize the moment. You know, there, there was Jonah. Now, we all know the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah specifically what he wants him to do. Detailed. Jonah just doesn't want to do it. And so he goes running. And, and God gives him another chance. Eventually, you, you may not see being swallowed by a whale and then spat up on the shore as another chance, but that's what it was. God gives him another chance, and he does what he's supposed to do. 
And you look at that and we think, man, what a loving God we have. And it's so important that we do tell people that we serve a loving God and that we serve a God of second chances. But folks, please hear me say this. Don't confuse God's willingness to give you a second chance in your life with your failure to follow the expressed will of God. Don't think that's a ticket to do whatever you want to do because he'll just let it go. Don't think from the golfing game you get a mulligan with everything. That's not the way it works. Folks, we, 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 let me tell you something. I believe in, in shopping and supporting local business. I always want to do that over big mega stores. Always have wanted to do that. I always feel that's important. I, I remember reading not that long ago there was a uh, back, back, back pre-COVID, I guess you'd say, there was a movie theater in a small town, and the people banded together and said, man, you know, we really wish you'd stop showing all these horrible R-rated movies and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the owner decided, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to listen to the people. So he started showing G and PG movies. Guess what happened? People stopped coming to the movies. In fact, the very people who said, you know what, you ought to not be showing those kind of movies, didn't go. And so eventually the guy started showing the other movies again, and they said, what in the world happened? He said, well, you said this is what you wanted, and then you didn't do it. They had one chance. I didn't do anything about it. You know, you read stories about people like Sam Walton and, and Bill Gates and, and the great businesses they built, as, as Gary was speaking about earlier with Amazon and so forth. But how about, how about people like Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A? How about R.G. Letourneau and all the building uh, machinery and the university and so many other things? You know, if you look at the end of the chapter here, here's Israel, and they hear this story, and, and they're like, no, 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 we're going to go back. We're going to get his leaders that are going to go back. But Moses comes before God and begs for the people, and somewhere along the line, towards the end of the chapter, the people kind of get the idea, and they say, you know what? We have really fouled up. We have made a mistake. You know what we're going to do? They go to Moses, and they say, hey, tell you what, we fouled up. We missed our chance, but you know what? We understand now, so now we're ready to go. And Moses says, don't do it now. Don't do it now. I talked to God, and God has said, not now. He's not going to destroy you, but not now, because he's not going to be with you. Oh, no, 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 Moses, it's okay. Now we understand. We got all this figured out. And Moses says, no, this is not your chance. But they decide to do it anyway, and they go out. And guess what? They get routed. They're defeated. They missed the moment. How many times do we miss God because we're unwilling to seize the moment and join him. How, how many times in our lives are we unwilling to be obedient to God? We say, oh, I wish I just will knew the, wish I knew the will of God, and God makes it extremely plain and clear, and all of a sudden we literally have to turn our head away from him to say, I don't know what he wants me to do, and he's making it clear we're just unwilling to be obedient at a given moment. How many times do we do that in our families? in our churches. But if you're looking for the formula for failure, don't seize the moment. Wait for those second chances. Hope they come. You know, one of the most moving moments in the film Braveheart is when the character of Robert the Bruce comes back to his leprous father who's basically been manipulating him and everything. He's been manipulated into betraying the true leader of Scotland. And he's telling his father, he says, you know, I betrayed him and I, and I saw it in his eyes on, on the battlefield and, I, and it just tore me apart. And, 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 and he said, I his father looks at him and says, look, all, all men betray, all men lose heart. And suddenly he turns and he looks at his father and he says, I don't want to lose heart. I want to believe. 
and I will never be on the wrong side again. For those of you that don't want to lose heart, that want to believe, the formula for success is the exact opposite to the formula of failure, just as the right side is from the wrong. Accept the promises, not the perceptions. Follow the Holy Spirit, not your instincts. Seize the moment. Don't wait for possible second chances. Yesterday, September 11th, 9-11. 20 years since that fateful event. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I was on my way into the office. We had just moved back from overseas just a month or two earlier. I had stopped off at the post office on the way in, and there was some discussion about what was taking place. They were listening to it on the radio. And at the time, they thought perhaps some small airplane had accidentally crashed into one of the towers. It was possible. Drove on to the office and turned on the television there. And then I sat there and watched what was taking place and couldn't believe it. One of the older ladies in our church came in and we both sat down in our chairs in front of that TV and we just sat there and held hands as we watched. We did that the entire day. You know, I remember that as if it happened yesterday. I know the families who lost loved ones then do. And I, and I think about as Gary mentioned about the materials, the ship that was built from materials from that as well. And so many other things, the cross, you know, the beams that form together in a cross that stand before one of the buildings down there now. And, and I found myself thinking about the cross. I, you know, he, he, think about here, here, was, here was Jesus the man who proclaimed to be the Son of God, the man who pro proclaimed to be the Messiah. Here's the man who went around preaching to literally thousands of people, performing miracles, feeding people, healing people, bringing sight to the blind, causing the lame to walk, driving out demons, bringing the dead to life. All those things he did. And then he's nailed to a cross, spat upon, whipped. And as he dies on that cross, all of that appears to be going away. And, and I think about that, and, and I can't help but think about what many consider to be the ultimate failure story. God then turns into the greatest success story ever. Let me ask you a question. Are you looking for the formula for success? Let me tell you something. It is really this simple. One plus one. You plus God equals everything. The only question is, are you part of that equation? Father, in a moment we're going to stand and sing. And there's some here this morning who have never met Jesus Christ. Maybe up to this point they viewed the cross as a failure. And according to the world it was. But it's not the world that matters. It's you. When Jesus died on the cross, he took their sin and he took my sin. He took our place. And Father, the reality of it is the cross was not the end of the story. 
He rose from the grave. He lives today. And even that's not the end of the story. He's coming again. That will wrap up the story. The question is, do we know him? Now, we can either choose to keep doing the things that we've been doing that have worked out so well up to this point, or we can choose to put our trust in Jesus. There are some here this morning, Father, that need to take that step. For there is no greater success in this life or the life yet to come than to unite oneself with God. But Father, there are some here this morning as Christians, just as Israel did. We've, we buy the lies. We trust perception rather than your promises. We, we follow our instincts rather than the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then we wait around for second chances. We miss the moment way too many times. Father, today needs to be the day we turn that around. Today needs to be the day that we surrender ourselves to you. Today needs to be the day that we realize that you are God. And that means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is that if you are God, I am not. And if you're God, then it is all about you. And therefore, Father, it is about what you can change in me. If you have the answers and all the resources, and you're the one that puts your hand out to me and to us and says, take my hand and follow me. Oh, Father, that we would do that as your children, that we would do that as your church because that is the only reason and the only way that we will ever accomplish what you've called us to do. This is your time, Father. I pray that you would move as only you can and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for all that you do. For us in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we stand and as Gary leads us, let me make this real simple and clear. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this is your time. You step out from where you're standing. You come down to the front where I am and simply say, Pastor, I want to know Christ. We can pray together and you can meet him. You're looking for a church home. If this is where God has led you. This is your time. You step out, you come to the front where I am and you say, Pastor, this is where God has led me. This is where God has led my family. We want to be part of this church. If you're here today and you know God has been speaking to you, whatever that may be, now is that time. And I want to tell you something. I'm going to throw this out to our men. I'm not saying men are more important than women. Please don't anybody walk out of here and say that. But I'm challenging men partly because I am one. Men, it is time we took a stand. It is time we start growing. It is time we lead our families. It is time we lead our community. It is time we lead those in our neighborhood. It is time we lead those that we work with into a relationship with Christ. It is time we take a stand for Jesus. Now, I don't know what that may mean for you, but I know it's time. And it is also time that you stop waiting for somebody else to do it. It is time that you do it. It is time that I do it. Now, you can keep waiting for that next chance, but understand that next chance may never come. If God is calling you, now is that time. What is God calling you to do? Will you stand for him as we sing? You do as God leads. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, Child of weakness.
us watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it a crimson stain he washed it white as snow close your eyes for just a moment as Janine continues to play quietly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Folks, I realize that you can pray as easy at your pew as you can anywhere else. And I hope you're doing that. I hope you'll come back and join us tonight because we're going to have the prayer service tonight. Yeah, we're going to pray. We're going to sing a couple songs and praise to God, but we're going to pray. We're not just going to talk about prayer needs. We're going to pray. But I, I, I am calling you. I'm calling on you to to do something. And granted, anything you do in here doesn't really matter unless you take it out there. And I understand that. So here's my challenge. If you really want to make a difference, As important as the time is that we spend in here together worshiping and praising our God, the difference is made when you walk out those doors and you take that out there with you. And you share that with a world that desperately wants to silence anything that has to do with God. That desperately wants to silence His truth and desperately wants to silence his love. So take your commitments that you're making now. Take them outside these walls. And not just today, but tomorrow and Tuesday and the next day. And as long as God gives you breath on this earth, Take it out there. We can either be Israel and say, oh no. Or we can be God's church and say, dear Lord, <laughs> lead us. Would you be seated, please? Uh, we're going to see 
a video in a moment. I want to set that up, and then I know Roy's got some things that he wants to share with you, some announcements and so forth. The video you're going to see has to do with our state missions offering that we're receiving throughout the month. I don't know where we are in that offering right now, but I, I guarantee we have a long way to go. I can promise you that. Our goal is $5,000. We can reach that. I encourage you. There are offering envelopes on the, the, um, the boxes here in the back where we give uh, that say state missions offering. Take one of these if you haven't already and pray concerning what God would have you to give to the state missions offering and understand that it is a love offering. So I hope and pray that you will understand that means what we give above and beyond our, our regular giving. Uh, I want, again, I mentioned tonight, we are having a prayer service at, at 5. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to praise God in Psalm, but we're going to pray. And one of the folks I'm going to ask you to add to your prayer list right now is a wonderful young lady by the name of, of Allie Wright. Allie Wright is, uh, is a young lady who just turned 18 last year in our church in East Texas. She has a lot of physical issues. She's had them since she was a baby. She has always gone to Children's Hospital in Dallas, but now she officially aged out of that, and she is now at one of the regular hospitals, and not only does she have all the issues that she has, but they think she has COVID as well. And so they're treating her, and I, her, her parents have been keeping me up, and I promised them that we would be praying for Allie Wright. So please add her to your prayer list. My, my stepbrother, uh, Raymond, uh, 78 years old. He is at home right now. He's the caregiver for his wife, Ann, who has, uh, who has Alzheimer's. He's been vaccinated, and he now has COVID. Uh, so I would ask you to pray for Raymond as well. Uh, we'll pray for them tonight also. But there's just so much going on today and, and so many things taking place here and other places. I hope you'll be involved in all that's going on but let's not lose sight of the most important thing, and that is living the gospel before people, sharing the gospel, living what we claim we believe. That's what makes a difference. All the activities in the world will never make up for that. So, you know, if you ever ask me what's going on, when's this hit time or that happened, and I, I may just appear forgetful, and I, and I may be, uh, having had another birthday. I'm not 65 yet. Okay. Hmm. Where's... Oh, it was that guy. Oh, yeah, I said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know where you live now, so anyway. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, it, it may be forgetfulness, but then again, it may be because I'm trying to focus on, you know, I, I've learned, I've been at this enough years to know how easy it is to get distracted on other things. Let's always keep our focus. Show the video. Where is Guymon? If you was to kind of look in the center of the United States and you kind of put your finger right there, that's where it's at. Where nothing blocks the wind, and then all of a sudden just the tumbleweeds are going across the street, and they say, welcome to the panhandle. When God called me here, they had 23 people. I'm thinking, Lord, <laughs> I love your sense of humor. Uh, you know, why you call me to the tumbleweed place? Why here? because I have a purpose. I thought, well, God is gonna get this thing going. And he did. We were seeing growth. There was more and more people coming in. It was nice to see these younger kids come in and, and decide they wanted to be saved. We had pews all full. We were near about 65 or 68 in that area. I thought, man, we're on a roll. What little bit we did have, were seeing, went away with the pandemic. We had to close the doors. It really knocked us down. Walking through this auditorium and there's not a single soul here, that was very devastating. I threw my hands up in the air and paid my notes in the air and says, why now? The tithing's coming in very slow and our people, please understand, are great. They're giving with all they have, but it's not enough. We have no more money. We can't make payroll. We don't know what we're gonna do. We thought it was the end. We were planning to close the doors within a month. Yeah. It was hard. It was tough. I've been a member of Grace for 25, 26 years. This church, they're my family. It was so disheartening for all of us because 
without the churches, we're not going to get God's Word out there. And that's kind of when we reached out to the Oklahoma Baptists. We as Oklahoma Baptists together, um, through our state mission offering, has funds that, that can help churches. Grace Southern is receiving some money on a monthly basis to help the doors stay open. When the Oklahoma Baptists stepped in and said, we love you guys, we want to help you, it was a sense of refreshment. We have engaged in this six-month ministry to revitalize this church. Others are going to come help with Bible school later in the summer. There's been a prayer walk up here. We're here this week doing a revival. And every night there has been different people coming to the service. We are getting some visitors that haven't ever been before, and that's what revival is for. Since the pandemic, we've had seven souls come to know Jesus as a personal Savior, and we've had nine baptisms, and I think for a little church, that's fantastic. Some of these ladies who've been in jail who've been coming are coming on Tuesday nights, which to me is another open door that we didn't have before the pandemic. Well, I got saved in Texas County Jail in Guyman, Oklahoma. Any other church I've been in, I'm always the youngest in the building, you know? So I was kind of like discouraging to find a church that after COVID is still trying to get involved in the community. He has a huge youth that are coming and that are attending, that's the next generation. And so there's potential here. And the new people coming in, they may be the next Sunday school teacher, they may be the next missionary, and we can be a part of that. I wanna encourage you and thank you. As you give to the state mission offering, you're helping every other church in the state carrying on. We might be a small church and there might be larger churches, that doesn't matter. What matters is that we can come together in unity, and it makes me very proud to know that Oklahoma Baptist has your back. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. We are, we are so appreciative of every little bit of help. Wow. What uh, a testimony that is to see what you guys have done in the past, see how God has used you in your tithes and your offerings and your giving. So we want to thank you for that. Um, we, we, as Pastor Tim said, we, we still want to reach our $5,000 goal. That is our church goal. So please make sure that you give. You can take an envelope. You can give. You can give on the app. You can give online. We have it all set up, ready to go for you. We just, we just need people to give so we can help churches like this. So please continue to do that in our, uh, it's our state missions offering. It's called the Edna McMillan State Missions Offering. So you'll see that, you'll see that set up online or on the app, and that's what you can give towards, okay? So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. We appreciate you. There's a lot going on, especially today. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get to go home, but hey, we'll figure it out, right? We'll see, we'll see how it works out, but there's a lot happening, okay? So we've got showers afterwards. We've got pictures that need to be taken. If you got a letter that today is your day to take your pictures, we need you to hang around. We're going to get you through as quickly, as quick, quick, quick as we can, okay? We want to get you guys out of here so you can go get your lunch. But we want to start our online directory as soon as we can so we can allow other church members to kind of see other faces. We've, we've had a lot of new people come through. We've had some, some uh, neat things happening. But we want our people to be able to see um, other people's face and try to put a name to a face. So we're starting this online directory. If you are scheduled to have your picture taken today in one of the three rooms listed, I believe it's 305. No, I'm sorry, 302, 307, and 308. Um, uh, we need you guys to hang around. We'll get you through there as quickly as we possibly can, and then we can get you out of there, okay? Uh, State Missions Roundup, we got that coming at the end of the month. You, you've seen the posters around. That's going to be a lot of fun. We need you to bring your cowboy clothes. We need you to wear them, okay? Wear your cowboy hats. If you have a rope, bring it too, okay? It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have that in the NPR. It's going to be a chili cook-off. If you make an amazing chili, and it's spicy, spicy enough for me to eat sign up to make it okay because i want to test it i want to see how spicy it is i'm going to see how good you are all right so make your chili get signed up right up there. there's a sign up sheet out there potatoes and praise there's also a sign up sheet out there for you ladies uh that's coming up pretty quick as well um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go through everything the last thing i am gonna say is we've got our family movie night coming up it, uh, that's next sunday evening at 5 p.m in the npr so 
please come, bring your family, okay? Bring your friends, invite them. We're going to watch the, that movie, uh, Mom's Night Out. It's going to be really, really cool, okay? Also, inside your bulletin is that Connect card. Fill that out, tear it off, put it in that offering box at the end of the service. We would love to have that, okay? Also, if you came to... Uh, came this morning prepared to worship by giving of your tithes and offerings. You may do so at the boxes. There are envelopes in the pews in front of you. You can put your offering in that, drop them in the boxes on your way out. We love you guys very much. We pray and hope that you'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock for our prayer service and that you'll also come back on Wednesday night for the everything that's happened. There's a there's a birthday in here, right? Brian, Brian Gantz. Brian Gantz's birthday's today. Am I right? Yeah, happy birthday, Brother Brian. Thank you very much for all that you do. So we, we love you, and happy birthday. If, if, if you have a birthday in here, happy birthday to you, too. We love you. Hey, let's close it out with He is Lord. Everybody stand. Let's sing. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord.